Pokemon has been around for over 20 years. That's a lot of time spent trying to catch them all. And with 76 titles including spin-offs, the series has amassed over 300 million copies sold. So the question then is, how does Game Freak keep us coming back to this series for all this time? And while a large part of that admittedly comes to the nostalgically joyous thrills of catching and building a team throughout your journey, each progressive generation has done its part in adding some new exciting features to the franchise. So today, I want to shine a big ol' spotlight on 7 additions in particular that I think really elevated the series for the better. Hey all you pocket monsters, I'm Skip the Tutorial, and this is Game Bites, an appreciation anthology of the best bits of design that gaming has to offer. And hey, if this is your first time here, then throw a dusk ball at that subscribe for weekly insights into your favorite mechanics. I'll go out on a limb here and say wanting Pokemon to follow you around is a pretty common notion. After all, in a series built off the back of developing connections with these creatures, any mechanic that emanates bonding is well and welcome. It's even been done in the game side of the franchise to some respect, with your Pikachu who trails behind you in yellow, simply because it doesn't like Pokeballs. Of course, taken after Ash's starter in the anime. And while being fleshed out more in the Heart Gold and Soul Silver remakes, I think ultimately the Let's Go series delivers the justice that follower Pokemon deserve in the series. A primary reason for this is that the games are designed truly in 3D, which provides a world of possibility for scales that just isn't logistically possible with pixels. From the get-go, this just fits better as well, since Onyx's almost 29-foot self can actually be rendered in an accurate scope, as opposed to the human-sized rock snake you see in Gen 4. The Let's Go games take this a step further with the given ability to actually saddle up on the backs of your beasts and ride these things around. Past strictly visual flair, this also gives a different amount of depth to movement options as you explore the familiar lands of Kanto. While admittedly not serving as the biggest gameplay shift offered up by these remakes, I do think it's worth chucking some praise to small bits like this for how they play into establishing the greater messages of the title. As you go about your journey, establishing and building upon your roster, you garner different relationships to your team, and getting to spend time with them out of battle is a huge plus towards that. I think one of the reasons that Pokemon has stuck around for so long is because it's incredibly satisfying to evolve Pokemon. So when that's the case, it's strange that we went nearly five generations without seeing much development on the system, past adding some new evolutions for the oldies in Generation 4. But this system really got a juice of life come Generation 6, where everything pumped up with the introduction of Mega Evolution. What this new mechanic opened up was the proper ability to reach the fabled fourth stage of evolution that so many schoolyard kids had talked about for years. On a service level, this ability does exactly what you'd imagine. Beast up your team into an extremely powerful state and opens the door for some remarkable strength in battling. Some even can be considered broken, and ones like Mega Salamence and Mega Kangaskhan actually have been banned from competitive play for this very reason. One of the compelling shifts for these new stages was the changes to their given types, where Charizard adapts from fire flying to the blue coloration of a fire dragon in his X form. This gave satisfying new combos to familiar Pokemon, bringing them up to different competitive standards with their strategies. And on the subject of strategy, it's hard to forget that the Megastone nature of these evolutions restricts you down to one pick on a single Pokemon once for their superpower moment. This optional decision gives a new level of depth to combat, as you need to choose wisely for which monster you turn into a sweeper, and when the opportunity is right, take the chance. Ultimately, this is a welcome feature to the franchise in my opinion, and one that could definitely benefit from more representation down the road in following generations. The Pokemon games are fairly nomadic titles. After all, they're predicated off your personal journey to becoming a Pokemon master, which requires a lot of traveling. But where do you go to settle down after you've caught them all? Well, the series answered this question at first in Generation 3 with the addition of secret bases. While these were a new way to spend time outside of battling, I believe that the Generation 6 3D remakes of these games in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire developed this best in their super secret base feature. Using the move's secret power in certain nooks and crannies around the map will give you the opportunity to open up a special place that you can claim as your own. Over a vast set of types, you enter into your own mini hunt to track down the perfect layout for your big project. And make sure it's something extravagant, because these bases can be shared around with other trainers through the use of the 3DS's Street Pass hardware or more commonly through QR codes. But what can you do in these bases? Oras gives full opportunity to pack your place full of decorations. Set up NPC secret pals to conduct a set of different powers that beef up stats like egg hatching or even massaging. Or maybe you even set up your own gym within the walls of your base. Given the ability to decorate your base with different floor elements and mechanics, you can essentially build your own battling challenge for newcomers to experience. And whether you make these daily challenges true tests of your friend's gaming prowess, or simplistic blissy EXP farms, 
the possibilities are robust for what you can create in these areas. Blending together the novelty of a creative outlet subgame with the battling elements of the turn-based combat, this idea comes together to be a pretty sweet side project when you get bored of just strolling Route 116 again. Pokemon games have had a back and forth relationship with post-game content. Besides the tagline goal of trying to catch them all, some titles in the franchise notably lack much to do after the credits roll. Of the series, however, I think a set of games that does a particularly great job of protecting against this is Heart Gold and Soul Silver. And not just because of their decision to feature 16 gyms with the beefed up help of the original Kanto 8, but rather for their gym rematch system through the fighting dojo. After defeating the League, the player scores the opportunity to go on a repeat quest around the iconic locations of their journey to track down the very gym leaders they had defeated before. Locking down their digits will give you the opportunity to call these trainers in certain windows to schedule rematches in the Saffron City location. In these round 2 battles, each of the leaders will be rocking a new and improved roster of creatures to try and take you down. I think the real appeal of these rematch fights is that you not only get to keep busy and level up your monsters, but also they build a connection between the player and the leaders past their set roles in the league. It makes a lot of sense that these key members within the region's Pokemon battling scene would continue to hone their craft past how you first saw them and it gives the player a wealth of new chances to frame their ever-increasing success as the Pokemon champion in comparison to the trainers that outline their journey. Throw on top the added opportunity to rematch the Kanto gym leaders as well, and these 16 total matches give a gratifying bookend to the player's earlier accomplishments by supplying the series' best lineup of sparring partners to date. Hidden machines have been a weird staple of the Pokemon franchise. These HM moves are characterized by their necessity in traversing the game's numerous different vistas outside of battle, despite being mostly lackluster picks for your moveset. And since these moves can't be easily forgotten by your own devices, this drives players to puff up two of their team slots with admittedly worse Pokemon just to serve the role of HM slaves. Driving players to lug around a virtually unusable Bidoof falls out of place with the larger themes of building your best and strongest team. Thankfully, this issue was rectified with the inclusion of Ride Pokemon and Sun and Moon. With the Ride Pager's ability to call in specific Pokemon, such as a Lapras for surfing or a Charizard for flying, these new modes of transportation open up a slew of new paths in-game, allowing for quicker movement on land, sea, or air. The player keeps the same benefits that existed with the earlier locked moves. Furthermore, it fits better to the world-building notion of the codependence between humans and pocket monsters when you can actually utilize these creatures outside of battle. Not to mention the joy that comes from actually maintaining full use of the six given slots, instead of effectively reducing down to four or five that previous generations forced. And while Devil's Advocate could say that the HMs of the past allowed for lesser used Pokemon to see some of the spotlight, it's hard to justify limiting the game's primary elements for what can be glorified held items. Despite some hints of clunky menu navigation every now and then for selecting these beasts, I strongly advocate for their inclusion in future titles. Because at the time the player, and the so-called HM slaves, finally got a break from the dated HM system of the past. After you work your way through the story, difficult players can be tough to find. Besides showing up for rematches at the Elite Four and dueling certain external NPCs, the series has had some trouble delivering a hard challenge after your first go through. From this, however, came the key inclusion of the Battle Frontier and Emerald. Taking the better bits from the earlier games' attempts at the concept in the Battle Tower, this veritable theme park of combat really gives the franchise a challenge worth fighting. Upgrading your trainer card into the Frontier Pass, the area takes on a new role as essentially a secondary league challenge to the player, with seven different facilities to battle in, including the likes of the Tower, the Palace, the Dome, the Pyramid, the Factory, the Arena, and the Pike. Each new location offers up an original set of battle restrictions and regulations to abide by in your fights. Making it far enough in any one of these challenges will pit you up against the building's respective Frontier Brain, who is a difficult trainer akin to the gym and Elite Four members you battle to get there. Defeating these folks once will net you a silver reward, but take them down twice for the real prize of a gold keepsake and a slew of BP. What's BP? Well, battle points can be used to buy slick new items from the local shop such as held items for future fights, or even a collection of dolls to hold on to. The real intrigue of this whole area is giving players a proper incentive to keep battling after the story closes up shop, and ultimately drives them to explore alternative methods of battling strategy that just aren't explored within the walls of a gym. Sometimes the core Pokemon League challenge is so good, it leaves you wanting more. Partnered with a history of spotty endgame content in the series, it's clear to see why maintaining that sense of progression is so important to players. 
So leave it to none other than the Generation 2 sequels of Gold, Silver, and Crystal to straight up double the amount of content with the inclusion of the original game's region after you blast through Johto. Taking the total up to 16 gems in these titles, the addition of this throwback set of gems goes further than just offering the same experience over again. First off, the way you explore the map is entirely different, seen as you begin your journey from the seaport in Vermilion as opposed to the quiet seclusion of Pallet Town. From this, the gem orders greatly shifted in the new path you trek throughout Kanto, adding on to the new perspective of the region this second part offers up. Moreover, it also gives you an interesting bit of world building insight into your impact on the land, following your actions in the first games. Chief among which is the disbanded state of Team Rocket, which echoes throughout the area, as Giovanni's post in the gym is taken up by your old rival Blue, giving a bit of progression to his character growth. On top of this, some locales look entirely unfamiliar, such as the lava-disrupted Cinnabar Island, which is now mostly barren from the local volcano, giving series veterans the ability to experience their old journey from a different point of view, while also sizing up a new challenge for tearing through an additional set of badges. The addition of a second region in GSC is iconic, and a packed-in piece of content that I think is well worth the praise it receives to this day. Hey there, use an elixir on this one in the top right for the 7 RPG systems you need to be playing. Or let Nurse Joy see you down in the bottom right for another video. Add that subscribe button to your ride pager and I promise it'll be there just in handy for whenever you need it. I'll see you over there. Take care, and you have a good one alright?